It's counting us in. But I, I hope that my screen's not uh, taking pictures of me for the IRS. I wanted to say, like, the CIA. But, you know, I think mm. it's very clear which one scares me more. I mean, the CIA wouldn't have anything to do with you unless you're international. It's the FBI you got to worry for. You got to worry about. Look, man, yeah. feds are failed. All right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I ain't worried about the. Uh, I'm not worried about the FBI because, like, they're just gonna sit there and kind of like, uh, you know, collect a paycheck for a little bit. But if it's the IRS, dude, they will audit and. They they steal your paycheck. They're like, nah. You you see that? Like uh, that the whole two hundred dollars you make. It would be a shame if someone were to uh, tax all of that and uh, be a shame if something were to scam, happen bro. to that. <laughs> <laughs> they really like scammed all of us into <laughs> agreeing with taxes. <laughs> uh, dude, I I saw oh, this man. thing like I forget when it was but they were hiring like a few thousand people for the irs with guns i'm like no they're gonna bust down my door and take all my dnd books because i didn't report them on my taxes <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna take our tabletops and our minis sam <laughs> not the minis please please leave me my tax deductible sound uh padding <laughs> this is next <laughs> I, I wonder how tax deductible child labor is like if i have my children uh you know stack my bookshelf with all my books is that tax deductible the fact that they're your dependents helps a lot mm, excellent that's why i got four of them is that the children yearn for the mines <laughs> you gotta get the them down there while their hands are still over? small we've all seen the rescuers i presume <laughs> Yes, you know, yes. That, that's going for the tiniest, most sad of the orphans to uh, go into the tiny, tiny cavern. God, that movie gave me chills. Uh, and about honestly, monsters. it's a solid plot hook for any campaign. Whether you're running interstellar, inter-realms, or just a run-of-the-mill backwater town, the children have gone missing, and we need them to work our minds. Like... <laughs> It's good enough for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, dude, I, I love the idea of you could give your players the, the moral quandary of they were hired to find these children. And when they finally bring the children back to the town, it's back to the mines for the kids. <laughs> no, we're trying to, to, to free them from the mines, from the terrible, terrible soul crushing labor. Yeah, so you, so what you get? Agree with child <laughs> no, <laughs> emphatically not. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I'm not Chinese, so I can't endorse child labor. <laughs> no. <laughs> And welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you dungeons, children, and homebrews. I am your host, Orion. Unfortunately, I'm host, Sam. Hi, and I'm their guest, Casey Jones. Nice to be here. I, but for the record, Dungeons and Talk Shows does not endorse child labor. We do, however, find it, if it's in your campaign, hilarious, but your players do have a sworn oath or duty, assuming they are good, aligned, or neutral, to do something about it, because children should be, you know, doing children things, like losing to each other at kickball. As long as I got the child union, I'm sure it's fine. You know what? <laughs> I'll give it to you. Child union. <laughs> I'm, we I, need I really recess, don't think buddy. that's what they meant when they said sh no child left behind. Yeah, exactly. Ah, so so Bush knew what he was talking about. Child unions, he, you know, Bush was a big uh, supporter of child unions. You know, all this talk about mines and stuff is, make, is reminding me of like, have you heard about that guy? Hold on, one second. What was his name? The guy who got <laughs> stuck in the Nutty Putty Cave. The what? You heard, you heard about that? Uh, that John sounds Edward like a Jones. euphemism for something. 
<laughs> it's not, I promise. <laughs> Did he write out Jones. an apocalypse log and then stick it against the nutty putty to make oh, a print? Man. If only. Oh, that's brilliant. He did that kind of, but with his face and body. So like, <laughs> he was a spelunker in like 2009, I think. And mm-hmm. he, you know, was spelunking. And he was kind of famous for getting stuck like face down. <laughs> Do it. Perfectly preserved. Oh, he, hold on. I got a perfect picture to, to demonstrate this. There you go. This is, this is how this man ended up. <laughs> oh, that poor man. And that's just what made that thing. <laughs> he just went into his cave one day and just oh, got stuck. <laughs> that's I mean, we all way want to, to be, we all hope that we are immortalized in some way. We what hope it is not go. in Nutty Putty. My, I mean, Spelunkers are... <laughs> are a different breed, honestly. I, I, I would say so. <laughs> Having that urge to go deep down, hoping that you stumble upon the Underdark or some sexy drow ladies and uh, avoid any spider uh, goddesses along the way. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, Wait man. a minute. He's cooking. <laughs> See, there's, there's a homebrew monster idea right there. Instead of gelatinous cube, you have your your nutty putty cube. The uh, nutty it doesn't, putty. It doesn't dissolve the things. It just grabs the them and suffocates them. <laughs> It can just hold not. images of things. Just like it presses up against something and then now it holds that image. So it's oh God, that's awful. <laughs> that's ultimate camouflage. Yeah. Like a thousand years from now, they just like, find ooh, it. It's just a ooh, face. <laughs> <laughs> Ropers and gelatinous cubes, step aside. The nutty buddy is here. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <sighs> they gotta write this one mm. down right here. I putty monster. What a, there's a lot of like scenarios that people put in their D and D games, you know, where it's like it's not just a threat you gotta fight, you know, you gotta work a way out of this situation. Being trapped in a hole is, like, <laughs> is horrifying. It's not a good place to be. <laughs> oh my god! How many times like do you think your character would make it out of that situation? I, That's I, I a don't really know. good question. Like, yeah. it depends on the roles, honestly. Yeah. We need those math rocks to be on our Having, side. Having, like, a mm. haven is disastrous. <laughs> That's a TKO right there. <laughs> it, it, it could. It could be. I mean, the last player, uh, last uh, character I played would have had zero problem because she's all about moving earth with magics and stuff but if you have like a party that doesn't have that kind of a magic okay but forget mm-hmm. about it toss that shit out the window you the cave-ins are a dangerous <laughs> thing you got right. stalactites and stalactites don't ask me which is which i think so stalactites I... uh yeah. stick down stalagmites stick up yeah yeah yeah. there's this like a there's like a time. rhyme yeah, no, the, 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 the monic is that the M, the, the points oh, of the yeah. M of stalagmite is how you remember that they point up. Yeah. And the T pointing down of stalactite is how you remember ah. that stalactites are from the ceiling pointing down. Smart. Mnemonics! Smart. <laughs> <laughs> I do oh, yeah. love a good mnemonic device. The people, mm. you do learn things at this show. <laughs> <laughs> and don't let anyone... Buddy, tell you That's otherwise. Your user, <laughs> All right. We so, were trapped in a cave in, and I was pinned under several pounds of stalactite, not stalagmite. <laughs> Get it right, <laughs> god damn it. <laughs> that is the kind of pedantic I expect from a D&D player. <laughs> What's the consistency of this cave? Is it like a nutty putty? <laughs> oh, man. Nutty Putty is pretty bad, but uh, we've also thrown um, spontaneous combustion and hot spots at players <laughs> and in mines. Yeah. Um, they were sent underground to dig not for gold, but for garbage and um, okay. encountered like charred bones, blasted out wagons that were burnt to a crisp. You know, the shadows of someone. Uh, oh, like the a wall nuclear blast type deal oh well i mean like just a flash fry someone right goes up like a roman candle all of a sudden you know that's all they wrote mm. they should have brought <laughs> some canaries <laughs> we did that was actually a plot point they have canaries that go with them they can pick them oh, up at ooh. the uh the the 
The good, the dry goods store, Walton Dry Goods. <laughs> you can pick up some canaries for your travels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we got canaries in stock. We do. Look, pet stores are not something that you hear about in your D and D games. <laughs> I need more. Well, pet I mean, it was in more D&D of D&D. a general store, but canaries yeah, yeah. and you know okay, everything like else that a miner would need. <laughs> Tractor supplies. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, I got to keep my wife away from the tractor supply. They, every season uh, in springtime, they uh, bust out all these little chickens and ducks. I'm like, no, stay away. <laughs> They're too adorable. We can't take any more. I, I started getting the, can I get a goose text from my girlfriend yesterday? <laughs> That's where it starts, dude. Like these are just evil. Like the, the, <laughs> they make, I mean, that's, the, that's your first warning. But I mean, geese are just unpleasant. Like they, not they, allow they, they leave their crap people. everywhere. Like, <laughs> good lord! The college oh I went to had a yeah. pond that was basically just taken over by a gang of geese. So you basically had just to watch your step uh, wherever you went, and geese hiss. I don't know yeah. if you've ever actually seen a geese, a goose hiss at someone, but when their beak opens up and that little tongue comes out. Um, it's just dreadful, <laughs> horrifying. Yeah. I've known people that have had guard gooses that attack uh, people. Like, yeah, it, the guard goose is straight a real thing, Sam. But before we get too off the rails on that, uh, uh, Casey, please uh, tell our listeners what it is uh, you do. <laughs> Hi, You're everybody. Uh, my name is Casey Jones. I am an author and a voice actor and the uh, host of, there's a cat here, the host of Anywhere But Now, a Doctor Who actual play podcast. We use um, music from the wonderful Tabletop Audio. Shout out to Tim. His mm-hmm. uh, scores are absolutely amazing. Um, but sound effects from the show, maps I draw myself, um and put a new time lord in a new tardis with new companions and shoot them off to somewhere in the galaxy uh based on the idea that it's more fun to watch to play someone who has not done these things 50,000 times already like mm-hmm. the doctor you know um instead someone facing the daleks for the first time and not knowing what to do and having to figure out their own ways to use their sonic devices and things like that um mm-hmm. I also run The Joy of GMing, a lovely podcast interviewing nice. creatives like yourself. We've had game writers on, uh, a scholar uh, who has written about critical role professionally, um, and other game creators. We had a uh, a colorist from the Titan run of Doctor Who comics on with us a couple of weeks oh, ago. Wow. And cool. um, we've got another episode of The Joy of GMing coming out Sunday morning at 9. That's awesome. Yay. I'll have to check. So, it yeah. out. Cool. Please I do. Am probably the biggest, like, I'm completely ignorant to anything Doctor Who, honestly. <laughs> I it's 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 one of my absolute favorite shows. It's my favorite game to run. Um, and on startplaying.games, I run games of Doctor Who for new players as well mm-hmm. as uh, Curse of Strahd because I'm a sucker for horror, which I think is the reason I'm here today. <laughs> makes <sense. laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Doctor Who is a it's one of those. It's well known for creating some of the most terrifying and iconic monsters in modern media. Hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, even I part- know that. <laughs> Part of the the public consciousness, at least in the the UK, is those are those hide behind the sofa bits. You know, mm. when the Daleks come rolling out of the smoke, or the Cybermen come marching out, or God knows what other kind of monsters they're they're dealing with that week. Like kids at home used to hide behind the sofa and just mm. peek their eyes out and then hide because the things were so scary right. or you know creepy. Um, one of the one of the most incredible things Doctor Who does is take something completely innocuous and harmless and then turns mm. it into something that can kill you. And now you will never look at that thing again. Um, they yeah. actually got in trouble for that in the 70s because um, the police of the UK were like, uh, if you're going to make mannequins and things scary, can you please not put them in police uniforms we want kids to be able to trust the police to come and talk mm-hmm. to them and not go oh wait it might be a <laughs> nesting consciousness 
uh, thing. So like they, they, they do a great job of making you scared out of your mind of things that you should or should not be scared out of your mind about. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I love I, that. I've loved uh, watching Doctor Who for a long time. I'm not really the, uh, I'm not a old head about it where I'd, where uh, I've only seen like maybe a couple of the uh, older episodes, like back when it was mm-hmm. all black and white, uh, some of the earlier mm-hmm. doctors. So I, I'm more of a, uh, you know, Matt Smith, David Tennant kind of guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like as someone who grew up on classic who, but wasn't obsessed with it. Like, I feel like I'm at the right level of fandom where like, yeah, I could probably, you know, answer the classics. Well, who was in this episode quiz, et cetera, you Mm -hmm. know, but I'm not so precious about it. I was like, no, you can't have this show. It's mine. You know, (laughs) that kind of fandom has never, has never appealed to me. Right. But yeah, That's New Who yeah. with Russell T. Davies and uh, oh god, who else has been a showrunner? Um, Stephen Moffat and Chris Chibnall, less so. But like Stephen Moffat's uh, run on New Who was some of the scariest stuff out there, and he was the one that came up with the Weeping Angels. No, oh, I don't know. There was oh, a, wow. a New Who, like a like a remake well versus classic who that ran up ah. to the 80s to new who gotcha. uh starting with uh chris eccleston when uh that started off 15 16 17 years ago now right. yeah that, that sounds Lord. about right i remember watching a few of those episodes because i i was like okay finally i gotta check it out because uh, mm-hmm. i've known all these guys that they grew up watching it they said it's great i'll give it a chance mm-hmm. and you know it's one of those things that it does live up to the hype but I will never forget mm-hmm. the first time I encountered some Doctor Who nerds when I went to college. And uh, one of them had this little sonic screwdriver. And I was half convinced that this was some kind of fantastic technology that could actually unscrew things using sonic vibrations. <laughs> and I was so excited. I'm like, I got to so... know how this works. Uh, sh- unscrew something, please. I want to see this. And uh, if I know it's just a, oh, it's just a prop. <laughs> Y- y'all fucking with my emotions okay <laughs> expectations a powerful thing <laughs> that's oh, why man. i lowered mine <laughs> <laughs> expectations are dangerous for your health they are but hopes can be wonderful um <laughs> i moved to los angeles about five and a half years ago and traveled light um came out here with a pair of suitcases packed tight and one of the things in them was a bandolier of all of the toy replicas of the sonic screwdrivers from uh the second doctor on all the way down because you know those like and they make the noises and um (laughs) i still have to change the batteries from time to time but like you know i love a good prop replica too those things are a lot of fun definitely something to appreciate for sure Mm -hmm. Uh, i'd love to see someone design a little 3d printed uh uh, sonic screwdriver prop and then just Mm -hmm. slide it out boom all your dice (laughs) that's not bad yeah no um, that's not bad at all yeah like a a a riff on that dagger shape yeah uh yeah the dagger shaped uh dice container that would be really slick exactly and Honestly, it doesn't even have to be as bulky because dice objectively aren't even that big. Like, I'm just looking at some of my dice right here on the table. It's like, that, that's really, that, that that's really not you know, that bad. Think, no? If you've seen uh, Guardians, the, the movie with like Jack Frost and Santa and stuff. Oh, Rise of the Guardians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that movie, by the way. But you remember the capsules that they had the teeth in? That's like exactly what I'm picturing. Like okay. There, there's okay. a little like thing and you crack, like you open it and it like has a little space in the middle. Mm. You can fit yeah. this in there. I, I'm thinking Good. like, uh, I've seen these little uh, tubular things that they sell over at Bull Moose and, mm. and they, they'll have just like eight dice all stacked like one on top of the other. With, like Right. Pension. Yeah. If you just use that as your core and then just uh, 3D printed a thing to go around it, just boom, slide it right in yeah. that easy. I'm still a sucker for like a little felt bag, 
you know, yeah. like I keep laundry quarters in one of those because who doesn't love the high fantasy of, well, all of my money jingles and jangles <laughs> yeah. in this little felt purse. Little coin you purse. Know? And cool like cow. the dice, I also like the clackety clackety in the inside the bag, you know, same, for, for easy same. travel. <laughs> Dude, when I, I had like my metal dice. I loved yeah. having them in the bag. Yeah, m- my brother recently just gave me a uh, a peach uh, crown royal bag for some dice uh, this past oh, week. Hell yeah. Exactly. Yeah, about that size. <laughs> uh, crown royal. They really need to start uh, doing good marketing, like. Let people know that you're you're selling dice bags that come with an entire <laughs> bottle of booze. Yeah, man, the heck? it's a free market. <laughs> put your put your favorite dice in this bag. Also, can it may contain cognac. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. What every D and D party needs. <laughs> I, I put together oh, a very shitty video <laughs> months ago of me doing an unboxing with a a thing of Crown Royal. Be like, okay, we're going to review this Crown Royal dice bag. Oh, what's this? Some apple flavored whiskey? Well, delicious. That's perfect. <laughs> My players drive me to drink all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did they know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the perfect gift for your DM this Christmas season <laughs> Crown Royal. Sponsor the show, Crown. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine our first sponsor is Carl Royal. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, I'd be the happiest you've ever seen me if that were the case. Dude, I love Jack Daniels. Please. More power to you. <laughs> I, does, I, does Jack do I haven't touched a drop of alcohol in not. about five years and not have not looked back. Um, cannabis, which is lovely and legal is uh one of my uh favorite ways to relax but uh more more whiskey for you fine folks yeah I, i'm not a big drinker but i do enjoy you know jack every now and then shout yeah. out to moderation shout out to moderation <laughs> honestly <laughs> i feel like Rob i could be the poster like child for moderation time. Yeah. enough Just is a enough. little bit <laughs> Just enough to get you there, but not so much that you black out. Moderation. It's like that meme where it's like the guy standing in the corner. They have no idea I'm fucked up. They're like, your <laughs> eyes are literally closed. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear. But damn. Oh, man. So I've so... seen the uh, Doctor <laughs> Who books before. I like had a friend that had a, one of those uh, books just lying around. I'm like, dude, how do you how do you play this? Like. What is what keeps everybody from be saying I'm the Time Lord? No, I'm the Time Lord. The whole party is Time Lords. Um, cooperation, basically, um, with Doctor Who, the game and the show. The Time Lord in question, who's the title character, tends to be the driving force of what's going on. Um, and if the player is playing the doctor and, you know, like, well, I know what I'm doing. I've already done it 15,000 times. They may, you know, grab the reins and the companions may have to like, just, oh crap, let's try to keep up with this person, um, which can hinder some of their autonomy, you know, like it's great to go with the flow, but you also want the companions to be able to make their own decisions and things. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I'm putting together a table, I usually try to make sure that there is only one, maybe two time Lords, uh, per table, and they have you know at least one companion to balance them out a piece, so that it's right. not just you know they need the 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 term the straight man there to to balance them out you know yeah, yeah um, absolutely yeah but um, the companions we've got uh, Maeve played by. Uh, Kate is absolutely incredible. She's she plays Maeve as this uh, intrepid reporter from 1890. Mm-hmm. And um, anytime I need them to like grab onto the plot with with their teeth and not let go like a freaking terrier, I can either just say, OK, well, here's the story of the week or tell mm. them not or tell them they have to do it or or tell them they, under no circumstances, they cannot do it. Uh, right. Because reverse psychology is a wonderful <laughs> tool for the right players. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah and, telling um, them they can't do something will drive them to try to do it so much harder. 
Mm-hmm. For sure. Every time. Every time. <laughs> yeah. It's wonderful stuff. It's wonderful stuff. But um, yeah, putting a table together of like three to four uh, with one or two Time Lords in the mix. So you've got the wacky eccentrics who may or may not try to put on a British accent later. And, uh, you know, do the piloting the TARDIS, like actually getting you from point A to point X, skipping B mm. through W. Um, time travel jokes. Um, but uh, the companions I like I've found personally are usually the ones that like grab onto another NPC, someone to talk to and connect mm. with somewhere in that game's setting. Um, and they they're off to the races from there whether it's like a tour guide or someone that works for the mayor or mm. um, a mascot at a theme park, like, or sorry, no, a robot at a theme park. Um, mm -hmm. Like okay, give them five minutes to talk and they'll, they'll, they'll have, they'll have given you all the, the pro the plot prompts you need to, right. to coax them in the direction you want them to go. Definitely. All right. So the, uh, oh, oh, oh. So what the companions <laughs> seem to do is like they serve as the rock that holds this campaign together, essentially. Yeah, um, the camp, the the companions are the the beating hearts of the story, while the, the they keep the Time Lord on a swivel uh, so he doesn't get too distracted by, mm -hmm. you know, the sci fi problem of the day or things like that. Um, and one of the things I've really enjoyed is um, one of the best things about the Doctor Who system from Cubicle 7. It's now in its second edition, and um, they've also brought out Dungeon uh, Daleks, Doctors and Daleks, which is their, you, their version of the same game, but with D&D &D rules for D&D mm. &D players who don't want to figure out what they can do with two to three six-sided dice instead of, well, I want to use all of the dice. Um, yeah. But one of the best things about it is uh, it identifies what their drives are. What is this person, what does this character want? And once I know what their driving goal is, I can use that as a carrot or a stick sometimes mm -hmm. uh, to gauge their interest, to help drive them along. And when they actually do the thing, when the character pulls off the feat that they thought might or might not be possible, the looks on their faces. Like, we've had tears of joy this season, I shit you not, that uh, came completely out of organic role play and characters following their goals to their, I won't say natural, but their mm -hmm. eventual conclusion has been really, really freaking satisfying. Man, that's always the, the hope of a DM, you know, to evoke those natural reactions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like moving into mm -hmm. the campaign that we're going to be running up soon, uh, I'm going to be running a One Piece campaign, and the uh, main main thing that I've required from every one of the players is you have to have a dream. Your your character has to have something <laughs> like a big goal, something that they absolutely want to achieve. So like, well, in your typical tabletop game, like maybe a player has a dream, maybe they don't. No, nope. mm -hmm. you, you got to have something that you want. And mm -hmm. I want the entire campaign to be very player driven and what says player driven, like dreams and things that they mm. want to aspire to. Absolutely. Or nightmares to mm. avoid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a very f cool point. I mean, for example, I'll give you some of mine. So I, I'm going to be playing a uh, fish man who mm. is a chef um, merchant, you know, so he wants to use his skills and craft to create masterworks of bladesmithing, create unique weapons for those special to him, become rich and world renowned in his trade, you know, make that paper, discover, <laughs> combat, and consume. He do be liking to eat. <laughs> create delicious food out of the supposedly disgusting devil fruit to creatures of the world. Hopefully, nothing pescatarian. Man. <laughs> if he's a fish man. <laughs> Open to all avenues. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun for sure. And uh, oh, kind of like the uh, Doctor Who thing, uh, the crew does have a captain. And I've uh, given that role to the most headstrong of our players, the, the one that's more willing to 
just like, okay, I'm ready. Let's start a fight. Like, okay, this is going to be. It's also be probably time. the biggest fan outside of Orion here <laughs> in the group. <laughs> nice. It, it certainly works. I'm happy to hear that. Well, Sam, what do we have for our monster this week? Oh, so to keep the theme with the whole Doctor Who thing, you know, I figured why not talk about one of the most iconic monsters of this world, right? The Weeping Angels. <laughs> they are <laughs> classics. <laughs> they really are. They're oh, they're utterly horrifying. Um, the Weeping Angels uh, first showed up yeah. in Blink, a Doctor Light episode, mm-hmm. meaning he was only in it for about five minutes. Um, <laughs> And you've got stone statues that mm-hmm. are covering their faces anytime you're looking at them because while they're being observed, they are mm-hmm. trapped in stone. And when you're not looking at them, if you blink, that's yep. when they get you. And yep. we were talking about that that thing of like, you know, oh, well, that's innocuous. That's harmless. That's just a statue. It's fine. And then Blink came out and no one who had seen <laughs> Doctor Who ever looked at a statue the same way again. Like, oh, no, for uh, sure. That terrified uh, a generation, right? Like, mm-hmm, instilled mm-hmm. so much into this culture. It still, like, it still does. I, know, I, have, <laughs> I have a few examples that kind of, you know, branch off of this idea to talk about. But yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah. Like you said, it was in the Blink episode, and I have a quote here from that. Don't blink. Don't even blink. Blink and you're dead. They are fast, faster than you can believe. Don't turn your back. Don't look away. And don't blink. Good luck. Good luck. The Weeping Angels as a tabletop monster is still horrifying. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. the core books... <laughs> have gone out of their way to make sure that everything they can do in the show is a mechanic in the game. Mm -hmm. And And one of the scariest things they can do, just how fast they are, equates out that, you know, in every turn, in every every turn, um, you can move, you can fight, you can talk, Mm -hmm. or you can do something, and you've got time to do maybe one of those things. You know, you've got one action per action round, basically, if this were in D&D. Weeping Angels have four. Yeah. Per Holy turn. shit. <laughs> so they can move, crazy. move, 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 attack, move, attack, move, 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 attack, attack, or any combination thereof. And they are just faster than anything. And like the mechanic of having our players roll awareness rolls to see if they blink or not. Um, and <laughs> using their own narration against them. Because I'm a big fan yeah. of collaborative storytelling. Like, I set the scene, and then you tell me what your characters mm-hmm. are doing. And um, one of my favorite mods to to run for people, not usually the first one, because it's a lot harder than some of them, uh, takes place on an art gallery on a spaceship out in the middle of the galaxy. Um, that is about to head under an ultraviolet star in about an hour. You're going to schmooze. You can dress up. There's going to be fancy people there. There's going to be art. There's going to be, you know, performance dancing and things like that. And then about two hours into the events, that's when the weeping angels uh, Mm. make themselves present. And um, they can move that fast and they can grab people and then make them vanish by Mm -hmm. sending them back in time. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Don't get too much away. I'm going to go into the abilities later. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't want to stop you, but I was like, oh, he's cooking. (laughs) Apologies. Apologies. (laughs) It is hard to stop once you get going. Oh, man. Oh, that was good. I love this. This, They're so cool. And I'm, I'm glad you're excited for this. I have another quote here from, I believe it was from one of the episodes that the doctor was describing. Mm-hmm. The lonely assassins, they used to be called. No one quite knows where they came from, but they're as old as the universe, very nearly. And they have survived this long because they have the most perfect defense system ever evolved. They are quantum locked. They don't exist when they're being observed. The moment they are seen by any living creature, they freeze into rock. The fucking spider. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no choice. It's a fact in their biology. In the sight of any living thing, they literally turn to stone. You can't kill a stone. Of course, a stone can't kill you either. Then you turn your head away. 
then you blink, and oh yes, it can. Oh yes, it can. I believe that's also <laughs> a quote from their first appearance. Um, yeah, I believe so. But uh, oh my god, yeah, because these things are made of stone. Whenever you look at them, and unless you've got a jackhammer uh, <laughs> handy, you're out of luck. This is one of those things. This is one of those occasions where the the objective is not to kill the creature. The objective is to survive <laughs> the creature and creatively yeah. trap it somewhere that can, it can no longer try and kill you. And this is something where like if you don't figure it out, like mm -hmm. how it works fast enough, you're done. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I have a little bit of talk about the like what they are too. Um so like you said, you know, they're an ancient race that are described by the doctor as the deadliest, most powerful, most malevolent life form evolution has ever produced as they can sometimes kill without a thought. However, the weeping angels generally prefer to send a victim back in time before they were born to feed on the temporal energy that represents the life that person would have lived through. As a reflex defense mechanism, though it renders them unable to socialize with each other, weeping angels revert to stone statues when looked at by another being, including themselves. For this reason, they are often seen as covering their eyes with their hands, giving the impression that they are weeping. When in fact, this is done to prevent them from looking at each other and turning to stone. Once their target's gaze is off them, the weeping angels can move upon them in less than seconds. Even in the image of weeping angel can take a life of its own. That's really interesting, though, because now I'm thinking about it. They're covering their faces, right? Mm -hmm. They have to have some other sensory, right? To mm -hmm. know they're not being observed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess well, they would feel the, it, right? Well, that's where yeah, the quantum good. locking comes into play. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. because, I guess they, like, they would feel the difference in their bodies, right? Yeah, because so. they exist as quantum beings fundamentally. Because, like, mm -hmm. when when they are observed, their entire mat, their their body, their particles are yeah. once observed, assume a static shape. So their very yeah. na their natural state is being amorphous. So like mm -hmm. you, you can, it's impossible to actually see their true form in, in yeah. fundamentally. Oh, I guess so that's yeah. your, yeah, yeah. Cause even if you're observing them a distance, they can't move. Right. So it's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Of course, if you see one at a distance, then you're in a new kind of trouble <laughs> yeah. because how long is it going to be before you blink or turn mm -hmm. to run away or right. get dust totally. in your eye? Things like <laughs> Back that. Up. We had our Time Lord, the mm -hmm. Fixer, was in one of the darkened hallways of this mm -hmm. gallery. The episode is called Gallery of Fear. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at this point... Um, angels are down the hall and terrorizing the hoity toit fancy rich people that were also on the ship because right. having people to save, having people to rescue other than just the players adds mm -hmm. to the stakes, yeah, like adds to the situation. terror. <laughs> and when you're mixing in sound and have just screaming in the background, replace the classical music of the gallery uh, and just Back in the, the record in the background is just nice. <laughs> 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 but at one point, um, the fixer talks about he turns to mm. uh, Dora and says, uh, "You know, so and so about the angels." I was like, "You turn to her mm. to say this?" <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Lose one story point. The creature is behind you. Um, and he's like, wait a minute. But I was telling her, I was like, okay, Dora, roll. Did you blink? Did he break your line of sight by mm -hmm. turning to talk to you? Turns out he did. So the angel got its grips on someone else. Um, what you mentioned, though, Sam, about how even the image of an angel can kill. Um, yeah. Since it was in an art gallery, uh, we had the idea of um i don't know if you ever saw season two of lost but mm -hmm. uh there was this wonderful scene in the underground hatch where um uv lights went on black lights went on and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they were surrounded by maps and warnings and all sorts yeah. of weird cryptic stuff this. Yeah. that they didn't really have time to explore um, but it introduced me to the idea of paint that is only visible under a black light. Mm -hmm. So we put angels on these 
paintings that were only visible when they'd reached the ultraviolet star that they were flying oh, under. That's so brilliant. an hour after they were oh. like, okay, oh. we've only got like the one stone angel here to deal with. That's the good news. And that's when they hear the screaming over their shoulders. Why are they screaming oh. in that hall and that hall? And they oh, turn that's and awful. angels are reaching out of the paintings. And at this point they're just made of paint. They're completely mm. two dimensional. And if they get their hands on someone, that's when they become they more you real. In. <laughs> well, they 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 grab you and they eat your vitality to 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 right. build their own. You know, that's awful. They're hungry. That's that's <laughs> that's <horrifying. laughs> Oh, absolutely! It really is. Um, one of the there is a great uh, the Angels Take Manhattan Eleventh Doctor. It's mm -hmm. a River Song episode with Amy and Rory. It's a heartbreaker. You should absolutely check it out. Mm -hmm. um, but at one point. River Song, one of the most intrepid badasses to ever, you know, travel time and space, uh, gets caught by a weeping angel mm -hmm. and has to break her own wrist to break free. Mm -hmm. I turned that into a mechanic um, really? of the game where if the because it's not fu it's not as fun if the angels are immediately trying to kill you. They want right, to play right. with their food first. You know, mm. they want you to know just how much trouble you're in. So a character could sacrifice a coordination point for the rest of the game and break their own hand uh, or break their own wrist to mm. get free of the grip and like, great, okay, you're free. Now you have less coordination than you did right. before. And that's going to be that way until the rest of the game or the rest of the mod. Um, sacrifice, you know, it, love ugh, it, getting their hooks in you. Yeah. That's yeah, a and the last thing I have right here is I, I wonder if you've heard about this, the, uh, the audio drama fallen angels where, um, three weeping angels were trapped inside earth during its formation and were eventually discovered during the Renaissance inside Marvel. Yes! Blocks. Was that a fifth doctor story? I believe it was something like that from what I was reading. Uh, yeah. Believing it was a miracle, a group of priests and believers formed the Order of the Three Angels, commissioned yeah. Michelangelo to release the angels. And the angels were defeated by the fifth doctor and locked under the catacombs of the Sistine Chapel. I, I adore Big Finish. <laughs> Big Finish, That's the oof. audio company, they, they were basically the torchbearers mm. in the canceled years between the end of the seventh doctor's turn and the eighth doctor's uh, made for TV Fox movie. And mm. the less said about that, the better. Um, but they hired the actors from the original series, the producers from the original mm. series, writers, composers, um, and basically just did audio versions of their own episodes about an hour long or a half hour long, depending on which season they were in. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were a huge inspiration for me because I ate up big finish and wanted to do an audio drama style thing of who and mm -hmm. anywhere, but now is my answer to that. We use music, right. we've got sound effects, we've got stakes and a good cliffhanger. Like I, I adore a good cliffhanger. Like a game yeah, yeah. needs to end on a solid, oh crap, what do we do now? And that's where we're going to pick it up tomorrow. Like next <laughs> yeah, week. For sure. uh, I'm taking notes right here. <laughs> Cliffhanger. <laughs> so I've been, uh, I've been a pretty big fan of the SCP community for a pretty long time. Tell and us more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, one, my, my introduction, I guess, to what the Weeping Angels were, was something kind of similar. Uh, SCP-173 dubbed the Sculpture. The sculpture, sorry. Um, very, you know, uh, relatable to a weeping angel. Um, mm -hmm. It was often called the Neckbreaker 9000 or Peanut. <laughs> <laughs> so SCP-173 is a two meters tall, six foot concrete statue with bizarre markings that kills all living things on sight, moving towards its victim at a speed of several feet in one blink of an eye and snapping their necks with irresistible strength and lethal precision. In addition, mm -hmm. it's completely invincible. It also periodically produces feces and blood onto the ground of its containment cell, which must be cleaned up from time to time. <laughs> so SCP-173 cannot move as long as someone is looking at it through eye contact, similar mm -hmm. to the Weeping Angels. Thus, a victim has a chance of escaping from the anomaly by keeping their eyes focused on it. You know, obviously, same kind of deal. The best shot, given at how fast it moves, is that a person blinks, takes a chance to somehow glitch walk. <laughs> so, which is, I guess no one is able to see it, you know, 
run or really move. It's just there. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, can, I can see where the inspiration came from. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, it, you yeah. know, this idea doesn't have the same <laughs> time fuckery. It is the, you know, the general idea of the statue will kill you if you look away. <laughs> I do love time fuckery, though. What I gets, really do. <laughs> I don't know what the uh, reproduction of Weeping Angels is like, but 173 is a little is a little interesting in that. Um, <laughs> give me one second to get it here. So I believe they are, if left alone long enough, um, being unobserved, um, they will begin to multiply and sort of replicate themselves. And they have to be, you know, observed so that they're not allowed to do this. <laughs> but it has been known to happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's, they just... it's horrifying. <laughs> Suddenly, I, there's a ton of them, and the world. I believe is that for the for Weeping <laughs> Angels, their reproduction is done through a form of quantum entanglement, where uh, something, mm. an object that holds the image of a Weeping Angel, will become a Weeping Angel. There have been, mm. uh, I, there was even a episode where one of the uh, companions in the show had a Weeping Angel reflected in her eye, and that like a. Uh, became like a whole thing uh, inside her mm-hmm. head as it's like it was trying to take over uh, and it's just like mm-hmm. okay so staring at them is how you keep them from you know moving and shit mm. but staring at them also means that you have the chance of the, their reflections being within mm-hmm. your eyes and it's like okay so that, that's a problem mm-hmm. you know in the last the thing contact I'm... aspect of it i think mm-hmm. that was the real uh mind screw for amy mm-hmm. Um, which was actually the first episodes that Matt Smith shot. They shot that episode before mm. they shot his uh, his regeneration episode at the start of the season. Um, mm. But yes, if a person gets a quote unquote angel in their mind um, without the doctor around, it is only mm. a matter of time before that person becomes a weeping angel themselves. And that's actually how the angel gets on the gallery ship in the first place. Um, it gets itself implanted in in the right person's mind, and then it bides its time. And the character starts to sleepwalk and touch up paintings in the middle of the night and uh, draw yep. invisible angels on the paintings <laughs> and things like that, knowing that they're going to be traveling under an ultraviolet star later. Like mm. they set themselves up for success. It's they're like a, like a insidious. sleeper. Agent. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> no, and I, I went ahead and I got a list of their abilities, you know, just to kind of sum it up as like the final thing. What can these boys actually do? Right. So we got the quantum lock. We got the nine vulnerability. I imagine in stone form that can't be broken, can't be destroyed. Right. That's what I would imagine. Stuff like that. Remote time travel, time energy absorption, self replication. I'm curious to what degree. Or to what uh, circumstances, you know, what that would require. Maybe it's like on kill or like after a certain amount of time. I see the possession that you were kind of talking about, implanting Mm -hmm. stuff into the mind. You got the speed. Electrokinesis is interesting. Night vision, supernatural stealth, strength, proxy communication, and consciousness manipulation. Yeah, no, they're horrifying. (laughs) One of the scariest things they can do is just point at the light that is keeping them illuminated, and then it starts to flicker, and then you're Ah, in trouble. I see. Um, (laughs) They've been doing that since their first episode, so naturally I felt the need for them to be able to do it here as well. Mm. And um, in one of their secondary appearances, it was uh, added that they also eat radiation. When they're not eating oh. people's lifetimes, they can also just soak up radiation of certain kinds sense. from like a ship's warp drive and things like that. Right. So every time the characters think they have a grip on things, think they know like, okay, well, we've just got the stone angel to deal with. That's when people start screaming in the halls. Okay, we're mm-hmm. dealing with the paint angels. Where is the stone angel now? And that's when the lights start to dim because Mm -hmm. the angel has gone down to the reactor room and is now just eating the energy coming off of the reactor. 
Right. And then they have to go down to the reactor room and <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> it's horrible. It's absolutely oh horrible. God. <laughs> the real son of a bitch though is when they like they get the whole first half of the episode the half of the game walking around the museum and taking the tour and like oh things bend this way and there's a loop and so forth. There are so many blocks to mm. line of sight here and there oh, and no. over there that they have to be conscious at all times looking around <laughs> everything is, like... so that someone in the group is keeping an eye on it and like roll an awareness roll do Jesus. you blink odds or evens <laughs> 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 and they still did it they still pulled it off like awesome. yeah the it's the it's not as impressive, I think, to just create an invincible monster right. that will eat your soul. You know, you have to give the the heroes legitimate ways of thwarting them. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just a done deal. If you're smart enough, if you're resourceful enough, if you're quick enough, and the math rocks agree mm -hmm. with you, you can actually make it out in one piece. And I am delighted to say uh, that the teams I've run Gallery of Fear for have all made it. No one has ever awesome. like lost their character on one of those games. Came close, Amazing. but no one's actually, you know, failed to make it through. Thank goodness. But yeah, that's that's all I have for Weeping Angels um, and SCP-173. I think it's really cool. Great topic. I love just this whole thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, they're, they're horrifying. <laughs> I love shit like this. We don't need, we don't need a fight score. There's, there, no. Could you survive <laughs> one though? <laughs> uh, I, I'd say if you have a good team, you might be able to make make it out. In a one v one, nah. In oh, a one v one, nah. in a one v one, you're screwed. Nah, no chance. You're absolutely guarantee. Screwed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you'd have to have Any a good good team. <laughs> Well, any good game of Doctor Who or episode of the show sets up that the villain's downfall is baked into the plot. Mm. Whether it's, you know, their seat of power will also be their undoing, or their doomsday weapon gets turned on them. Or third thing, like with the Weeping Angels, usually it's some kind of a trap scenario of like, mm. we're trapped in here with them. The trick is no. They're trapped in here with us. How do we right. get smart about this? You know, um, mm. so that you don't have to pull answers and solutions out of complete thin air. You just have to be smart and be paying attention. Yeah, and, this is a you know, get creative. This is a great you know example of like creating creative problems for your players, right? Like, mm -hmm. you can't just fight everything out. You gotta mm -mm. actually think about it. Yeah. I can just hear the DMs out there frantically taking notes, like. Ah, uh, in, <laughs> instead of having them deal with your typical D and D puzzle, the monster is the puzzle, right? <laughs> Pretty much, yes, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Or the monster, like I, I often have things where, like, if you guys are fighting something that does stuff with the ground, there's a chance it's causing a cave in or something, mm -hmm. like, or it's gonna try to bury y'all, <laughs> like. <laughs> like <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and the, that's a, a situation in itself. <laughs> like, I, I kind of used to think I did not care much for fighting combat scenes in games. Mm. Um, I had not experienced good enough fight scenes in games right. to really grab me. Um, because up until very recently, I had kind of avoided D&D. &D because, mm. you know, like outside of some actual plays like Dimension 20... Um, usually it's not about intrigue and problem solving. It's about kill that thing, play two rounds, and then kill that thing that's trying to kill you. With right. Doctor Who, both the show and the game, it's about nonviolent solutions. Mm -hmm. Whether it's talking to them and getting them to change their mind, turning the oppressed masses against their oppressor, thwarting their doomsday device. Um, like part of setting up one of those mods is like, okay, here is what they're up against. How can this be turned against the bad guy? And mm -hmm. I, as the GM have to have at least some understanding of how that can play out so that when the players completely ignore all that and use things that like, well, what about this? And that second thing, like, yeah, sure. That'll work. Go for it. That works with <laughs> right. the established rules of blah, blah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> there was an episode we did called um, Troubled Waters, which takes place on a water world, a science center aquarium kind of deal on a water world and um, involving uh, gelatinous jellyfish, uh, shape-shifting jellyfish, the Rutans uh, as the baddies of the day. And I had gone to the trouble of coming up with like a handful of different things the heroes could have used to, to turn the tide, and they did not use any of them. They came up with their own solutions that still used the rules of the story mm -hmm. and got them to turn tail. Well, they didn't have tails because they're, you know, right. jellyfish. Turn squibbly Tentacle. and run. It was, <laughs> it was beautiful to watch unfold. It was just that's beautiful. Awesome. That, that's um, one of my favorite parts of. Uh... Uh, tabletops in general just being able to see players be like okay new idea we're, we're going to make this work and it's like i didn't expect that from from you guys that's amazing y yes here we go oh yeah are you have you ever uh done any improv orion or sam uh not you mean like go to a thing and yes and and all that stuff no not actually that's what i was going to mention the yes and um, I have a theater background and I've been on a couple of improv teams over the years and um, yes. And when someone gives you an idea or gives you a prompt, instead of saying, no, that doesn't work for the following reasons, your job is to say yes. And furthermore, blah, 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 mm -hmm. like adding on to what you've been given instead of trying to make it your own or right. steal the spotlight it's collaborative it's yes i agree with that and we're making it bigger yes and it's this and it's even fancier yes and it's this and it's even more and with running a game yes anding especially with doctor who where you know the the solution is seldom a violent mm -hmm. one like listening to what the players give me um one of our characters got into the habit of uh, job interviews on any planet they landed on. And mm. the first time they did it, it was with a hover bot, basically just the torso <laughs> and the head of this thing in a theme park. And I was like, yes, yes, you can get a job interview and we can do it right now. We're going to do this right away. Uh, a hover bot drops down and is like, how can I help you today? And has the interview process and so forth. And now calamity played by Dora, it has a mop and a jumpsuit and janitorial work to do. And she also gets a key card that will unlock mm. almost anything they come across because the janitor has to be able to get in to clean stuff. True. So she got a <laughs> plot coupon right in the bat. And it's just yes awesome. anding all the way. Yeah, I absolutely mm. love that kind of stuff. Like, I like to think of myself as... Uh, not exactly the yes and DM, but more of a, a yes and and yes but. Because I oh, don't absolutely. Like to give flat nose. Like, I, I want to absolutely. work with players like, okay, okay, sure. Th th that's a thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there's yeah, a you caveat. Bring, mm -hmm. <laughs> you bring up a great uh, uh, system f with the mm -hmm. Doctor Who rules because uh, depending on how you roll, since it's all 2D6s, um, if you roll and get a six on one of the dice, you get a yes and. Like, yes, you did mm -hmm. the thing you're trying to do, and you also get this bonus. And right. if you get a one on one of those dice and you succeed, it's a yes, but it doesn't quite go the way you want. Like, mm -hmm. yes, you have hacked the computers, but someone now knows you're here. Or, yeah, I mean, yes. this is effectively how, you know, ability checks work when people are like, mm -hmm. oh, I got a nat 20. It's a yes. And mm -hmm. you got a nat one. That's a yes. But, or I guess that would be a no. But <laughs> yeah. I, but, you know, it's kind of the same idea. I, I like to think I'm of the uh, checks where you're like, barely meeting or like a maybe one or two right. points below as your mm -hmm. yes but and, and that's like if you're mm -hmm. trying to be a little bit generous as a dm you know like yeah. you're gonna give it to them but there's a catch but, it's not I gonna be what you were expecting yeah <laughs> It's a great caveat of like, yes, you have managed to do this, but you have burned your hand on the console, which has been on mm. fire for the last two minutes and will be down a coordination point for the next hour. And we start a timer so that an hour later is like, okay, you've put on some topical cream. Congratulations. You have your coordination point back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. We actually added um, our own house rule. I'm a, a, I love a good house rule. Um, right. where so double sixes boxcars is the best possible outcome 
and snake eyes, the double ones, is the worst possible outcome. Someone mm. tries to jump over something, they fall, br sprain an ankle or break it and shout loudly so that everyone chasing you now knows exactly where you are. Right. I'm a big believer that low rolls can lead to high adventure. You know, just mm. because you failed doesn't mean it doesn't move the story forward. Oh, absolutely. Um, but uh, we, I also, but there are also some things in the game that are just extraordinarily hard to pull off. So to give the players an extra chance to make that happen, we also decided that double threes were the averagest average to mm. ever average of like, <laughs> you know, setting up that antenna thing to call for help. You roll double threes. You set up the thing to call for help. You did. Congratulations. It. <laughs> With no bonuses or consequences whatsoever. It could have gone better. It could have gone a job. lot worse. <laughs> Adequate. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, distinctly well, mediocre. <laughs> what a this is a great transition too. Speaking of mediocre and adequate, don't we have some news for this week? Uh we <laughs> do. <laughs> this is Tiana bringing you nerd news. <laughs> nerd news. Yes, oh, so we do have some nerd news <laughs> uh, this week. Uh, one of the uh, brief little bits that we got going on is: Have y'all heard of the 2023 Tabletop Awards? Uh, honestly, they tell us more. Tell more, us the more. Tablies. The, the tablies. We, yeah. we got to We got to vote. For them to just change that to the tablies. I, I feel like the tablies would really work. <laughs> have, like, what a uh, die mascot. Worst mascot what ever. The tabletop <laughs> award? Like yeah, so D&D &D and Pathfinder and so? stuff? Uh, honestly, D&D &D and Pathfinder don't even uh, make the announcement list. <laughs> really? Interesting. So, what are we looking yeah. at for the uh, nominees and stuff? Okay, so there's a few categories. Best board game best role-playing game and uh, let's see here a uh, best ongoing card game cool. which uh mm -hmm. and best art so that's a thing designer of the year and Ooh. publisher of the year rising star designer uh rising star publisher but thanks to the ogl at the start of the year tons of people were just kind of like all throwing their hats into the ring like yeah we're gonna take over we're gonna do our thing now let now wizard, <laughs> yeah let wizards burn it all down we're gonna build something new <laughs> and, and at and this year's tabletop awards are a major reflection of that viva la revolution right so mm -hmm. there are a few uh creators that have really uh done really well for the rising star publisher category like uh the finalists Ooh. are birdwood nice. games Cross Path Press, uh, Hegemonic Project Games, Hot Banana Games, Metis nice. Creative, Prismatic Wasteland, and The Wanderer's Tome. I I've heard of a few of these guys. So those are all cool names. Very nice. Yeah, those are excellent names. Absolutely. Then, like Publisher of the Year, we they got Ninth Level Games, Good Luck Press, Osprey Games, Restoration, Snowbright Studio. I'm not seeing any Paizo, any Wizards, like uh, none of the stuff that I'm used to seeing that's super mm -hmm. mainstream anywhere mm -hmm. on this list. Okay. Uh, the only uh, mainstream stuff I'm seeing on the list is under ongoing card games where mm -hmm. we get uh, uh, Magic, Pokemon, and then like Disney's Lorcana is on the list because uh, people are. Yeah, it's uh, heavily based on Magic, so. If you want a card uh, game that's like MTG but Disney, uh, there you go. <laughs> is, uh, is Digimon on that list for the, uh, the card games? Uh, not for the finalists, no. Ah, that makes sense. They are really fairly new, new I guess. Compared to Pokemon and stuff, they're... <laughs> Lorcana came out this year, though. I oh, think. okay. Then they're just getting dogged on, I guess. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like... People love Disney, though. They'll eat that up anyway. Always, always. But some of the uh, best role playing is games a powerful of the year, drug. It it really is. But Blade Runner is r right up there on the finalist list for the ro best role playing games. Uh, nice. This Discord has ghosts in it. Never heard of that. <laughs> I, <the> name. <laughs> I like the name. But <laughs> right, you're you're gonna love this one even more. Women are werewolves. 
Oh. I fucking knew it. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fox Curio's uh, floating bookshop. Okay. Animom oh, cool. story. Okay. Barkeep on the Borderlands. Uh, there, there's some interesting names on here. And if anyone's uh, looking to check out the uh, the winners for all the uh... child, can you not when I'm oh, doing a podcast? <laughs> uh, Everybody's got a pet. <laughs> <That's a kid. laughs> ah, apologies. I'm trying to keep I'll my take... cat Hastings out of out of too much mischief. I apologize. Uh, I, I feel that. I feel that. Oh, and then uh, let's see what else we got here. So, speaking of uh, tabletops, Wizards has released their final playtest for the year before they go into their new. 2024 one D&D 5.5 whatever the new D&D is oh boy. here here it comes <laughs> final play test they reverted the changes on <laughs> on now, some now their... is our chance to tell them what we want right like yeah everybody final... check it out oh. <laughs> let let them know let uh, your voice be heard honest opinions <laughs> we don't need the straight trash talk we got to be constructive for our hobby yeah. here even if uh, Wizards has been shooting themselves in the foot with uh, every bullet in the chamber, like emptying mags on themselves, like <laughs> this foot isn't butchered enough. Oh my god! But That's yeah, cool. the, some of the stuff that you can find in there, uh, what they've put together here for the final play test is mm. changes to barbarians druids and monks along with some alterations to spell casting and grappling rules and uh some uh, epic we needed more grappling rules honestly oh, uh, and the removal of some of their epic boon feats which is like oh what's wrong with epic boons if you manage to get to level 20 honestly as a dm i'll give you anything at this point <laughs> <laughs> the game like how much further are we going like let's see <laughs> you want to go to level 25 oh okay sure <laughs> have have a feat sir <laughs> <laughs> so some of the uh, they've made some little changes like uh, the barbarians uh brutal strike is replaced with is replacing brutal critical and they're doing some uh stuff to change advantage and increase damage short rest now grant them uh re regained uses of rage and persistent rage at level 15 restores all uses nice. during a long rest nice. and keeping rage until unconsciousness okay so some minor changes there if rage <laughs> lasts longer than four hours contact your healer immediately <laughs> oh man it's yes. too many blue pills man <laughs> honestly okay now that that's a character idea right there <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got they the went back on the uh, druid's wild shape uh going so it's like okay so there was a lot of negative uh reception on the previous iteration of druid mm -hmm. a lot of people they didn't like their owlbears uh, and what they want to turn into an owlbear damn it i want owlbear and i need it now much Baldur's so, Gate. <laughs> yeah, uh, some tr changes to various uh, subclasses for Druid. So if anyone's like planning on playing the the new Druid, check that out. Make your voices heard. Then finally, monks. They got some substantial changes to expand tactical options, so they so they can use their bonus action for attacks without dedicating their main action. Similar to uh, rogue actions, stunning strike will deal. Minimal force damage on even successful saving throws. So it's like kind of changing how it impacts a little bit. Mm -hmm. Overall, the yeah, okay. revisions seem to aim to address the mechanical issues and underperformance mm -hmm. of how these classes have been. Makes sense. I can see okay. it. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. And then let's see here. Uh, Sam, you're familiar with the witcher and cyberpunk a little bit very little 
Uh, I'd imagine a, a lot of people are. So the hmm. uh, one of the uh, Cody uh, Pondsmith, the he's worked on projects with that kind of stuff before. A big name in the industry for those uh, things. He's working on a new uh, system called the Mosaic System that's kind of inspired by cyberpunk, The Witcher, Naruto, and interdimensional travel. So a tabletop that kind of like combines all of that into like a, a small like into like just one thing. So okay. interdimensional ninjas. Hmm. <laughs> They've got my <laughs> attention. <laughs> okay. Like so Han Smith's uh, emphasizes the unique system's role in shaping the game's uh, distinct feel, moving away from uh, crunchiness towards quicker, more accessible experience. The RPG in integrates influences from uh, like Japanese mythology, 1920s America, steampunk Europe, nice. and an alternative uh, 2030s history. So it's like, cool. got like these four 2030s uh, history, history that hasn't happened yet. Yes. <laughs> Alternate reality history. <laughs> I, I guess so. Alternate uh, reality history that creates a new future history. Like yeah, the ambitious stuff, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're they're drawing a lot of uh, inspiration from anime such as uh, Demon Slayer, Naruto, Cowboy Bebop, and nice. infusing those uh, elements all into like a, a weird uh, strategic puzzle solving approach akin mm. to uh, Tenchu games, focusing more on stealth than direct combat. Okay. So rather than just be more combat focused, they want things to, you know, kind of play out a little bit more. And it even says they're Smart. also taking like a, a lot of, uh, huh, says that they are taking a lot of inspiration from Stargate too. So it's like, okay, so oh. big Stargate buffs up in the design team. Hmm. All right. Cool. All uh, right. It sounds like a clusterfuck, but a glorious one. <laughs> <laughs> I would be very interested to see where this goes or, you know, how it works and what they work on. Uh, it sounds ambitious, and I like I like the idea. I don't think that I can possibly explain this entire thing <laughs> and, yeah, sounds, and do it, do it enough justice, because there's, like, there, there's a lot going on here. I, I don't know if I can possibly unpack all of that. Interdimensional ninjas in a system that mo more so focuses on stealth, and physical combat. Okay. All right. All right. In a yeah. future-ish steampunky. Well, aesthetic. like it. Well, from what I was reading, it has like these uh inter like diff different uh, dimension settings. So uh, mm. one has like a more of a kind of traditional Japanese and a lot of right, yokai, right. and so you'll get to see it. all these cool yokai and oni in it, and that's just awesome. Like, do that's do right. you want to deal with Japanese yokai? Because some of those things are crazy. And this makes me think right. of like. The you know, like, what kind of animes can you adapt into like a D and D situation? Like, can you make like a Jujutsu Kaisen D and D game? Like, I mean, with this, cool. that that doesn't seem unreasonable. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Jujutsu Kaisen is more like a very powerhouse hero fantasy, but mm -hmm. maybe, maybe who doesn't love power fantasies, right? Like, <laughs> Absolutely. And as long uh, as we use that yeah. power for good, we're like a. Oh man, like a chainsaw man, like D and D. <laughs> that sounds oh. like that'd be a. I think Chainsaw Man might work good with a system like GURPS. Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> so Chainsaw Man, what do you do on your turn? <laughs> <laughs> Rip it out! <laughs> I'm firing my engines. <laughs> oh, Quick, give me that two-stroke oil. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's great. Uh, the last little bit of news, uh, the there was a bit of a backfire on, let's see, Goodman Games for doing their Indie RPG Creator Summit this year. Oh, right, it's right. Yeah, I saw that on Twitter this past week. Was like, Twitter has uh, been hot about this topic. Uh, apparently, they, they're going to be having uh, guys like uh, Bob Worldbuilder uh, at their Creator Summit. They got like, a, what is it, 57 people? Yeah, it's a ton of people, right? Like, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, mainly the thing that they are under fire for is when they did their promo ad on Twitter. Uh, mm. the, the main criticism is bunch of white guys, and yeah, 
Got like, their pictures I looked at the comments and it was just a, just a wall of comments and all of them basically being the same. Like too many white people. Can you not, can you not find any women? Can you not get any yeah. uh, people of color? And it's like, mm-hmm. I, I just kind of like look to my left, look to my right. Like you guys do know that you're talking about uh, tabletop games. Like the, the guys on this panel uh, all look like they're in their forties and fifties. Like the- yeah, I mean, and it, and from what I understand, it's not like there's not you know people of color no, in the summit. Are. People were just upset that the six or seven pictures they put up, none of them happened to be like one of them. Like, um, well, how are you supposed to feel represented if you're not represented? I can you know? get that, but I mean, at the same time, like that's such a small like it's just it picture. is it is, it is like, a relatively <laughs> small thing to to latch on to. Yeah. As the haters start to circle, um, <laughs> right. but like mm. even I noticed as mm. a right white right. this presenting dude in their forties, you know, it's like they 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 couldn't like have they heard of diversity? Do they know that <laughs> right. it's a word that can be used? It, it does look a little out because they got a bunch of like dudes in their forties and fifties. They all got like white beards and stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's- and like you know, to me, when they like this is a creator, or something I'm like, all right, this is about what you'd expect, I guess. And like it would have been mm. nice, to be like, oh look, a black woman or whatever. But like, it's not like they're not gonna be there, right? Or you can't find their images, I guess. But I don't know. I I feel like because I mean, there's the chance that like they didn't even make like the the image, right? They could have just put it in the AI, like grab some names or something, like <laughs> or you know, the most influential. No guests or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Like, a, maybe, uh, like, I try to assume, like, the best in people. Like, I, I like to not assume that right. everyone's being malicious in any given situation because we already have, like, too much of that going on in the world. You know Absolutely. what I mean? And but it's you just, don't like, need malice to create an oversight true. that is true. makes some people it's, it's feel a little ignored out of and overlooked. Yeah. You know, yeah, fair enough. It wouldn't have taken much for them to be like, "Oh, sorry, you know, do a new one or whatever." Oh yeah, they did issue an apology. I was looking at that today. Oh yeah, that's good. Alex. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. after getting a wall, like just <laughs> like, dude, absolute, just like nothing but backlash, and it's just like, oh, I feel so bad for these guys because I, mm. I just imagine that just. Someone's just like, okay, um, uh, who are the most influential people on the list? Okay, th- these are the names. Okay, boom, copy, paste, copy, paste. D- d- good, go. Like, like that, that's usually just... they do for events like that. They have like the the what are they called? Like the the special guest speakers or whatever. Special yeah, guest I... speakers sounds about yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, uh, like th- those were the presenters. I uh, I don't like I don't know because I'm not there, but. <laughs> <laughs> my biggest criticism of the people in the comment section is like okay well clearly y- y'all feel like uh, you're not represented and that's mm-hmm. valid but how many people here are leaving any suggestions for who should be uh, like y- y- who okay who should be in in this yeah, tell me because like i i want to promote all the like, creators you know i want yeah, to promote I mean, that's definitely these true because then it becomes a situation of like, do they, do they just want anyone like of you know, like minority or you know person of color or whatever? Does mm-hmm. it matter who they put up there? Do they just want to see like? You know? It would be it would make a difference if it felt like they made an effort. Yeah, you know? I agree with that. I mean, that's, that's just my impression. But... Take it for with a grain of salt. Definitely. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I wonder if they're gonna do a new uh, image, or just like you. We already know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if anyone's running PR over there, I they're probably just like bury the shit now, burn it, <laughs> get it out of here. They, go, they like go, made go, the go. post. <laughs> they like put it up at like ten in the morning. Like, all right, fine, that's out the way. They go to lunch. <laughs> Come back. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Office is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, like, oh shit, my bad. I moved a thing and then it blocked us out. Oh no! <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> uh, unspeakable evil. That is what I have done, Sam. 
right. I guess we're moving into our final segment here. We ready yeah. to yeah. bring up the final segment. Lots of fun. Excellent. Welcome to the generic realm where we promote small content creators, segue people. Um, creators much bigger than us. <laughs> now, I, I will give fair warning. I actually don't know the ethnicity or gender of any of the creators we find. Most of these are just people on Reddit, so don't uh, <laughs> don't cancel me over that one. Oh no, we've only been talking about the white men. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I see Truth usernames. Comes like okay. <laughs> Well, Scrim Bimbus didn't tell me his gender. Or or am I assuming too much? <laughs> Scrim Bimbus. Scrim Bimbus. <laughs> Scrim Bimbus is a fantastic name, by the way. Scrim Bimbus. <laughs> he didn't phenomenal. make that up, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why don't you start you us off, and... Sam? Oh, yeah. All right, I can do it. So today I would like to present the gluttonous guillotine featured by or yeah, featured created by Sin Lair. Um, that is what I found under their mm. Patreon. You can go ahead and check them out, guys. Seems like they make some pretty cool stuff. Love the name too. Three, Gluttonous three, Guillotine three. has a wonderful yeah. ring to it. This is a really cool. Weapon. I saw this and I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> oh absolutely. Like I, I'm pulling it up right here on the side for people to look at, mm. and it's just like, oh. There's a lot yeah. here. So when I first saw this, this kind of immediately made me think of uh, if you've ever seen God Eater, they have the the big weapons that are like made with the monsters that they fight with them. And they're mm -hmm. able to like turn into giant like mouths and bite into things. It was really cool. So this kind of thing made me think of um, <laughs> just the way the, you know, the blade has mouths and eyes. <laughs> So, the giant cool. cleaver is made from one of the broken weapons found on the body of Fra Fragil, the immortal juggernaut. These weapons that have been bathed and stained by Fragil's blood are permanently imbued by the wretched energy, which manifests as various curses. After heroes from Rastana theocracy successfully slain the juggernaut and scattered its body to different corners of the world, these cursed weapons were supposed to be destroyed. Unfortunately, the some greedy acolytes manage to steal and sell them to the black market, as they do. One of them is made into this gluttonous guillotine. This sword has been permanently merged with the small lump of Fergil's flesh that can still grow indefinitely, turning the sword into a gigantic blade with mul multiple gaping maws. All right. So this is a great sword, very rare, requires attunement. Mm. When not in use, the gluttonous guillotine appears like a giant cleaver with a clump of flesh on its tip. It will stay in its dormant form until you kill a creature with flesh and blood. All right. Oh. Into the first ability here, we got ravenous growth. When you reduce a hit point of a small or large creature with flesh and blood to zero using this sword, the blade will open up and a jaw with razor sharp fangs will grow to consume the creature. The sword will then gain one charge. For each charge that the sword has, it gains a plus one bonus to its attack and damage rolls. An additional 1d6 slashing damage and reduces your movement speed by 5 feet. In addition, for every two charges it has, its reach increases by 5 feet as the sword grows in length. When the number of charges exceeds your strength modifier, you have a disadvantage on your attack rolls with this weapon. After one hour since the last time a sword gained a charge, the sword will lose all of its charges and return to its dormant form. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> that is cool. Right. And speaking of curses, this weapon has a curse called Predatory. Ooh. This weapon is cursed, and becoming attuned to it extends the curse to you. As long as you remain cursed, you are unwilling to part with this weapon, keeping it in reach at all times. When under this curse, you will become unable to eat anything other than raw meat from a freshly killed creature. <laughs> when you see raw meat or a corpse within 30 feet of you at the start of your turn, you must make a DC 17 wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, you become overwhelmed by hunger and have to spend your next turn doing everything you can to reach and consume it as fast as possible. During this state, you will consider anything that gets in your way as a hostile enemy. All right. I like it. <laughs> That's cool. 
power for a trade-off. I like it. Yeah. Oh, oh, we could talk about that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you sound like you got some ideas, Casey. Let's hear it. Well, like we're, while we're talking about homebrewed weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> <Yes>. um, <laughs> like uh, in Who, uh, one of the the Time Lords more than once have taken a doomsday weapon like the Hand of Omega or Omega, if you're an American, <laughs> um, and hidden it away because they never wanted to use it. They never wanted to see it again and right. uh, thought it would be safe in a, in a trash heap somewhere on Totter's Lane. Um, and um, the moment was another one they made, a self-aware weapon of mass destruction uh, that tried to talk the user out of it or at least mm -hmm. give them the full understanding of what they were do what they were about to do when they actually used it, I couldn't resist. I had to come up with my own. Um, so the Time Lord weapon that the Fixer and his friends had to literally dig up in the Old West is uh, the <laughs> Scepter <laughs> of Attrition. Um, so like <laughs> talking about curses and whatnot, it's, all, yeah. it's impossible to find if you know what you're looking for, because like Ooh. the TARDIS, it can cloak itself as other things, including unimportant scraps of garbage. Right. Um, getting too close of it with the wrong mindset of gimme, gimme, gimme will set mm. you on fire. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. And, um, <laughs> actually getting your hands on it successfully requires a uh, mental role of ingenuity and you also actually have to already be a time lord if a human tries to learn what this thing can do they're going to immolate themselves um Man. you get a psychic readme file of welcome to your very own scepter of attrition a doomsday <laughs> weapon that can manipulate the forces of friction you now have a scepter that is roughly three feet long Ooh. that can cause earthquakes, spontaneous combustion, and also make you untouchable depending on how you choose to use it. And it runs on story points. Um, but basically, a weapon so powerful, the smartest thing to do would be not to use it. Right. You know, and then wrap an entire story <laughs> I do like around like it. That. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the I I couldn't resist, and I do love a good homebrew. I do love a good homebrew tool. Oh yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I'm mm. giving this weapon a D twenty or a, a nat twenty. <laughs> I like it a lot. I would both use and give this to a player. <laughs> I just like the art here because that looks art is thick. <laughs> oh man, and I would love like people add some flavor to it, you know. They start to use it after a while to take on some properties of them or something. I like mm -hmm. mm. or or maybe they use it after a while and they start to take on properties of yeah. that. I mean yeah. already with the ravenous hunger. No, I mean like uh, some aesthetic. Like maybe oh, yeah, yeah. you flavor mm -hmm. it more, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe you get like a like a bestial eyes or something. Like, you know, maybe your yeah. teeth grow. That'd be cool. Yeah, that's something to lean into. I love that concept. How about Power you, Orion? What you got? Well, I bring to you guys the uh, the War Domain Cleric. Now, this has been like a thing uh, before. Uh, like everyone's like, "Oh, hey, why don't we have enough War Domain Clerics in the game?" And damn it, who hasn't asked this question? <laughs> it's just like there are war gods, but why didn't base D and D have a War Domain? Like. Come on, wizards. What you thinking? I can see it. Uh, and uh, this is, a, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, war has many manifestations. It can make mm. heroes of ordinary people. It can be desperate and horrific. With acts of cruelty and cowardice, eclipsing instances of excellence and courage. In either mm. case, the gods of war watch over warriors and reward them for their great deeds. The clerics of such gods excel in battle, inspiring others to fight for fight the good fight or offering acts of violence as prayers. It's like, oh, OK, <laughs> I can get behind OK, that. Aries. I, <laughs> <laughs> and a, a lot of the uh, door, the domain spells are kind of a no brainer for a war domain. 
We got mm. Divine Favor, Wrathful Smite, Branding Smite, Magic Wrathful Weapon, Wrathful Smite, Blinding not, just, not smite. just brand name Smite. Oh man! Sorry. Uh, then we get Blinding Smite, Crusader's Mantle, Staggering Smite, Stone Skin, Banishing Smite, and Hold Monster. Like, uh, you, you, if you want your Paladin flavor in a cleric subclass. Here you go, buddy. This is Kratos in D and D. Yo, we heard you like Honestly. smite, so we put smite so on your smite. We're, start, we're yeah, starting right. on at uh, level one. You're going to get proficiency with martial and staggering smite. <laughs> yeah, we got all the smites. So, oh, smites. <laughs> yeah, you get a smite, and you get a smite. <laughs> Everyone, and look you under your smite. seat. <laughs> You've been smite. smite for everyone. <laughs> yes. So at level one, we're going to get proficiency with martial weapons and heavy armor, as you do. And then we get War Priest. Your god uh, delivers bolts of inspiration to your allies while you lead them into battle. If you if you deal damage with a spell of first level or higher, an ally can use their action to immediately after the spell uh, make one weapon attack against a creature that took damage. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty aggro, the, actually. Get I love effect. <laughs> get his ass. <laughs> yep, and then uh, moving on to our channel divinity at level at second level. Uh, you can use your channel divinity to strike with supernatural accuracy. When you are an ally within 30 feet uh, make an attack roll, you can use your channel divinity to gain plus five to the roll. Okay. And you make the choice of after you see the roll, but before the DM says whether or not the attack hits or misses. If the attack hits, it gains a plus five bonus to the damage roll. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And then uh, we get pretty basic, but, you know, totally on theme at level six with extra attack. I don't think I need to explain to our audience how extra attack works. No. You hit more. Good. Hit better. <laughs> hit more. <laughs> then, uh, following the theme of Divine Smites, how about Divine Strikes? Ah. At 8th level, you gain more... the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with Divine Energy. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can use your attack to deal an extra D8 of the same damage dealt by the weapon to the target. You know, you, when, I have the idea of this being like a pugilist and just going ham. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel that. Accurate. Uh, Accurate. Oh, man. When you reach uh, level 14, the extra damage increases to 2d8. Okay, so a little, little bit of scaling. And then capstone for the subclass at level 17 avatar of battle you gain mm. resistance to bludgeoning piercing and slashing damage you get a sasano uh, basically <laughs> uh, hello achilles <laughs> nice to meet you oh dude this just makes me think of like any naruto fans out there you bust out the sasano <laughs> 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 It would be Channeled hilarious. Oh, it would be hilarious if that avatar of war like was played like Achilles. Like, congratulations, you have all of these immunities and resistances oh. except for your heel. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I like now it. any now <laughs> any hit targeted at your heel is a critical strike. Mm. I can see that. Right. And it looks like uh, the uh, homebrew here is, well, they, they don't have like a Patreon or anything yet, but dude, get yourself a Patreon because I, I would support this kind of stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. Reddit user uh, Zenozen. Zenozen? Zenozen! <laughs> Shout out to Zenozen. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. It's like, oh, it's really cool. Learn to read Orion. Reddit users, give me readable names. Reading's hard. English is hard. <laughs> D&D's uh, easy. Reading's hard. <laughs> oh, 
Haters thinking they're better than us. <laughs> Those literate <laughs> assholes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Like All lot. right. Uh, I, this is some good homebrew for this week. I, I genuinely like it. So, Sam, a- anything you want to kind of uh, leave with our uh, audience or <laughs> a- a- any words, words of wisdom, Sam? <laughs> and just passed, you know, enjoy time with your family. Casey, thank you for coming. Is there anything you would like to say to the people? Yeah, plug your stuff. Where can we find you and your podcast and all this good, like, this sounds like some amazing content to me. Thank you. We put a lot of work into it. Uh, Anywhere but now, uh, Doctor Who Actual Play Podcast can be found on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts. We're on Twitter. uh, We're on Blue Sky. We're on Discord. And links to all of them uh, are on our Twitter page. And um, if you've been inspired by all this lovely talk about coming up with solutions to problems that aren't <laughs> violent or just want to go ham on some enemies in D&D, come find me on startplaying.games uh, and I will be more than happy to run a game of creative violence for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. And anyone That's... that wants to check him out, please leave a review. Let Let them know what you think because that kind of feedback all we find it helpful ourselves Mm -hmm. and i'm sure you do too yeah i do yeah absolutely yeah if you have any feedback please you know feel free to leave us a rating or a comment or a like or whatever you know no pressure but we hope you learned something but we are nerds right so what do we know what do we know (laughs) Nerd must stay. The nerd in me right now. Nerd, nerd must you. stay. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great weekend, everybody. Okay. And here we go.